forward to the bound and to the lost. They reach the world at any cost. But now the baton has been tossed. They say after the third generation, it's make or break. There's so much pressure. So yeah, we better be feeling the weight. How can we not when we know what's at stake? Who are we to think that we've got it all together? It's getting passed down to us, but we'd be nothing without our father. They've instilled principles to help take us farther. But if our heart's not for the people, then why even bother? To lead this generation, God's called us for this task. But if we don't take our place, will this be the last? There's a whole world to save. It's up to us. We are the third wave. Faith! By faith, Ed Morales and his young wife, Mitzi, were called of God to go to San Jose, California. They obediently went, believed God for the impossible. By faith, Steve and Josie went to Hayward and conquered the city. I was born in Glass Street. Then we went to St. Louis Street. Then we went to the Montebello. Then we went to there an in, in international. Then we came here and we're still growing. And we're still expanding. And we're still taking off. And we're still reaching the world. And we're still reaching the drug addict. And we're still is preach the word. What I will do is spread the gospel. What I will do is witness. What I will do is take cities. What I will do is reach my friends. What I will do is reach my high school. There's a people that make some noise for the pioneer generation. Make some noise for the Joshua generation. Make some noise for the now generation. Third wave makes some noise.
Thank you, God. God, for setting us free, for giving us victory. Oh, we thank you, Lord. God, there's no one like you, Lord.
God is greater and our God is stronger and God you are higher than any other and our God is healer and awesome and power our God and our God sing our God is greater
Because God, when we look back, God, at what you did in our lives, God, at what you took us out of, God, at what you saved us from, God, then God, all we can really be, Lord Jesus, be grateful, God. God, we give you all worship, Lord Jesus. At the very least, Lord God, receive our worship, God. Because, God, if it was not for all that you've done in our lives, God, we do not know where we would be, Lord. God, you are so great and mighty, Lord Jesus. And, God, we pour all of our hearts out unto you, God, because you deserve it, Lord. You deserve every bit of worship, every bit of praise, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your, for your awesome presence, God. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for showing up here tonight, God, for God coming into this place, allowing us to feel your presence, God. And God, we give you all praise, Lord God, all glory, Lord Jesus. We give you all the honor, Lord Jesus. We love you, God, and we are so, so grateful, Lord. Because God, we, Lord Jesus, could not have been here without you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and give God a hand clap of praise. If you guys are excited today, then go ahead. If you guys are grateful for what God has done in your life, oh, come on, I know the man's home is grateful. That's right. And we want to welcome you out here tonight at our third wave takeover service. Now, I heard Pastor Sonny say this. He said that I am the third wave. Pastor Sonny himself said that. You know what that tells me? That tells me that someone that wasn't, even before the pioneer generation, if he was the elder, he is the elder, and he's telling uh, everybody that he is the third wave, that that means it's not just a gang. It's not just the Joshua. It's, it's not just, uh, just one certain ge uh, generation, but it's every single generation combined together uh, that's a part of this third wave. Right, yes, yeah, so what I want you to do right now, okay, I know sometimes this can be a little, you're not supposed to do this, well, for the women anyway, I want you to go ahead and turn to your neighbor, whichever neighbor it is, and I want you to tell them how old you are. You can say it as loud or as low as you want. Tell them how old you are. Don't lie. Come on, we're in the house of God. Come on, say Come the on right now. age. <laughs> Shame the devil. And now I want you to tell that person, no matter how old you are, I want you to tell that person, I am the third wave. Okay, so I don't know about you guys. I know many of you may not have uh, ever been to one of our gang services before, but as a third wave, as a gang, we're proud, right? We're proud to be the third wave. So I'm gonna give you guys one more chance. I want you to take ownership, right? Because no matter how old you are, no matter what generation you come from, you are the third wave. So if you felt like you weren't the third wave before, I'm here to tell you that you are the third wave. So go ahead and tell your neighbor again, say, I am the third wave. you that are online whatever generation you are from whether it's the pioneer the joshua or the gang i want you to go ahead and rep which generation you come from there in the chat whether it's facebook or youtube um amen so right now we have something special right yeah very special we have someone that uh we consider be not just kind of special but very special we have a really really quick hello from from Destiny, she is over at the East uh, at the East Coast Training Center. But we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and play the video real quick. Locked in. I'm currently in the UTC East Coast Chicago. We're on our first crusade here in Minneapolis. I can't wait to see how God moves in my life and how He shapes me. And you know, I miss you guys all, and I love you guys so much. I can't wait to see how God has moved in your guys' life when I come home. Amen, amen. Isn't that exciting to see? To see someone, well, our very own uh, church being represented out in the, at, the, at the East Coast over in Chicago, making a difference in the world? Amen. And what we're going to be having next, we're going to be having a seven minute of fire. Now, this gang warrior, I've, I know very dearly. Uh, he went with me over to the West Coast Urban Training Center, and he did his entire year out there. He just came back, and this. A uh, young man of God, I call him young because we all know he's young at heart. He shows it. He's 32 years old. And one of uh, fun fact is that he loves to hike. So if you can all help me uh, welcome up 
Jonathan. All right, third wave. Third wave, are you in the house tonight? That's right. Shout out to the men's home. That's because that's where everything started. You know, God brought a wretched sinner like myself into that men's home, and he molded me and shaped me into the word I am now for the Lord. Hello, somebody. So I thank God for the UTC West Coast, and then I encourage all the gang, the, you know, the gang warriors and the gang girls um, to take advantage of going to UTC and the Third Way Leadership Campus because that's where God is going to expand you. He's going to grow your capacity. So that's in my encouraging words unto you. So with that being said, um, I'm just going to go ahead and pray this uh, in. If everybody can close their eyes and bow their heads. Heavenly Father, God, I come before you, God. I thank you, God, for this opportunity, God. I don't take it lightly, God, that I'm able, God, to share your word, God. And I plead the blood of Jesus, God, upon this congregation, God, and open our hearts, God, and our minds, God, and let your word, God, fall on fertile soil, God. And I'm holding on, God, to your promises, God, that you said, God, and your word, God, that you gave me in the man's home, God, that no weapon formed against me shall prosper, God. And I'm holding on to your word dearly, God, for this promise that you have given us to this third wave generation, God, for us to rise up, God, and take our place, God, in this call that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we say amen. So with that being said, if you can you turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 33. And the title to my message is Seeking God's Kingdom. Amen? So a little background. So when I was back in the man's home, who knows that everybody is concerned with what you wear. Hello, somebody. What, what am I going to eat? How am I going to provide for myself financially, you know, physically, physical food and something to drink, right? And everybody always worries about these earthly things, but they forget about the main thing, which is, I'm going to read it right now. It's about seeking God's kingdom first. The word of God reads, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, the reason why I brought this up this evening is because a lot of us, hello, I'm not the only one, that there was a time and place that we used to have this mindset. Oh, well, all I care about is what I wear, the job I have, how much money I have in the bank, how much food I have stored up, and then people are dying of starvation, right? So God placed this within my heart when I first came into the man's home, and I take this um, too hard because I come from a, a background that we were in poverty um, and people just like they don't know what to expect um, when they come to God, right? Because they say, oh, they're always talking about tithes and offerings, right? Hello, somebody. Where's my tithers at? That's right. All right. So God taught me how to pay my tithes and offerings when I was in the man's home. Hello, man's home. That's right. You got to pay your tithes and offerings. Hello, somebody. Hey, I know you're, you're hiding under your sock. It's all right. Um, but so in order for us to be blessed, we got to seek God's kingdom first. You know, it doesn't say worry about what you eat or your clothes, right? It says we got to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. So the more you worry about it and then. It's stealing you from seeking God's kingdom, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn, you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 at verse 6. Give me a loud amen when you get there. Okay, so. Okay. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. Okay, so if you're not really hungry for God's righteousness in these last days, then there's something wrong. Because when I was in that man's home, I didn't know what righteousness meant. I didn't know about God's kingdom or better yet praying, fasting, or reading the Bible. 
these are the basics of Christianity. So if we're not seeking God's righteousness in these last days, we're not going to make it too far in this walk. You know, and then one thing that I truly uh, encourage everybody to do in their prayer life is to ask God for boldness. Because um, one, the main duty for us as Christians is to seek God's kingdom and preach righteousness like Noah did. Because we're in these times that people are just tolerating sin. Hello, somebody. They're sure coding it behind the pulpit, and God doesn't want lukewarm Christianity. So in these last days, it's very vital for us to preach about God's righteousness and his kingdom. So I, I for myself, I'm speaking for myself here. I, for myself, I have this conviction that I ain't going to lukewarm the gospel of Jesus Christ for nobody. There's, there's one thing that God taught me in the man's home. If you want to be lukewarm, you already know the consequences. I don't got to quote it. Just read it for yourself. It's in the book of Revelation. Hello. We won't go there this evening because I only have seven minutes. Hello, somebody. But that will be a different message. So uh, I have another one for you. It's in the book of Proverbs. Hello. Verse 34. Hello. Just give me an amen when you get there. So all these um, Bible verses are very uh, key in these last days. If we want to make it for the long haul. Shout out to Pastor Carlos and Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Ruben. Uh, they imparted into my life a lot. So I have uh, a lot of respect for those men of God. Um, so the word of God reads, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. So hello, somebody. There it goes again. That word righteousness. So if we want to be, um, if we want God to exalt us, right, we got to seek righteousness. But if you want to live a life full of sin, well, guess what? God is not going to be there. Because God, our God that we serve is a holy God. And the Bible does say, be ye holy because I am holy. God requires holiness in these last days and I know behind the pulpit a lot of people don't like talking about it because it's very controversial right they say oh well I don't want to offend nobody you know I don't want to lose congregation you know I don't want to I don't want to sugarcoat it but if you ask yourself this question are you really truly preaching the gospel to please your heavenly father or are you here to please people that, that's one question that I ask myself every single time before I preach a message. Because I understand that in the times that we're in, we can't be lukewarm. We cannot sugarcoat the Bible because you don't want to offend somebody be, and you don't want to get them in their feelings, right? Because we are emotional without Christ. Hello. Because I know I used to be emotional back in the days. You know, just because you're a man doesn't mean you're not emotional. Hello. That's right. It's not just women. Come on, fellas. It's also the men. And if I, to be honest, some men do it more than women. Yes, I went there. Hallelujah. But with that being said, um, I'm just going to go ahead and pray out. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, God, for this time, God, that I was able to minister your word, God. And I hope, God, that your word fell in fertile soil, oh God. In the name of Jesus and all his people say, amen. Come on, give it up for Jonathan. UTC alumni, come on, from the West Coast. Come on, somebody. West Coast raises up preachers anywhere else. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> come on, I need a joke. But at this time, we're going to give offering. And I, if I could call the usherettes, um, if I could call the usherettes. And if you guys need an envelope, a United with Can envelope, you guys could raise your hand. And, and there's... Um, and I just want to read a portion of scripture. It's in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 17, 7. And it reads like this. It says, when he, came to, when he came to the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, why uh, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I could drink? 
and uh, she was going to get it and he and he called him and he called him bring me a piece of bread and verse 12 it reads like this it says, as surely as the lord your god lives she replied i don't have any bread only a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of olive oil in a jar I, I am gathering sticks to take care to take care to take home and make my and make a meal for my son and myself uh, that we that we may die uh, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said, "Don't be afraid. Go go and bring me the bread first. For this is what the Lord said: the God the the God of Israel says the jar of the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jar of oil will not run out until the day the Lord." sends his reign on the land and in this scripture elijah uh, uh, elijah goes up to a widow and he, and he asked and he asked he said bring me some food and you know what she says she said surely surely your god lives but i don't have much food there was a circumstance in her life something happened it says that she was a widow so she lost her family she didn't have much come on sometimes the circumstances just pop up in our lives Come on, sometimes that bill comes in. Sometimes we, we get less hours at, at work. Come on, somebody. Sometimes something happens, you end up going to the hospital, and you need to pay the hospital bill now. Circumstances come up. But, Matt, and circumstances come up. And something I want to point out is she said, as surely as the Lord lives, but I can't give any bread because I don't have enough. She believed that, that God was God. Sometimes we can believe that God is God, but yet we, because of our circumstance, it's holding us from giving. Because of our circumstance, we believe, sometimes we believe, but sometimes we have doubt, and that holds us giving. But man, just like the scripture said, Elijah said, go, go home, don't be afraid, and God's going to make, and God's going to continue to bless you. God's going to continue to give it. So as you give, it will never run out. You will never go right out. And in verse 16, it says, for the jar of the flour was not used up, and the jar of the oil did not run dry. And keeping the word of the Lord, and, uh, and keeping the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. See, as his widow, yes, she had circumstances. Yes, she had a reason not to give. Yes, she had a reason not to do this. She, she trusted what Elijah said that God was going to promise to her. It was a step of faith. It was a step of, yes, my circumstance. Yes, my bills. Yes, my kids need this. Yes, uh, you, you know, I got my house bills. I got rent. I got this. But I believe that God's going to take care of me. I, I'm going to give tonight because I believe that God's going to take care of me. And it says that the Lord kept his promise. See, tonight, no matter if we have a circumstance, if we have a reason or, or a reason to not give tonight, I, I encourage you, we give because we're grateful. We give because we know that God's going to come through. We give. I, I remember my, my, my youth leader, she will always tell me, she said, money is never an issue because God always going to come through. You know, I, I love that song where it says, show me a mountain he, he can't move. Show me a water she can't part. Well, show me a God that won't provide for your need. Well, show me a, a situation that God won't provide. Show me that. I bet you can't. Because God will always provide and meet every need. And if you guys could all stand, if you guys could all stand, we're going to pray for the offering. And I encourage you, no matter what, put your trust in God tonight. Give. Give and God will provide every rest of your need. And if you guys would bow your head and close your eyes. Father God, we just come before you, my God, and we just thank you, God, for this giving, my God. We just pray that you would just continue, God, to move with inside of our lives, God. God bless, God, those who are giving, God, in the name of Jesus, amen. And also, if you can't give in person, you can also give five ways to give, including our building pledge and our women's home. So if you guys could come up and give your offering to Evangelism night. It's gonna be on Thursday, July 28th. Somebody say tomorrow. Oh, come on, we're gonna be having one-on-one -on -one evangelism. That's personal evangelism. Where you're 
uh, walking up to somebody and you're talking to them, you're telling them personally about who the Lord, uh, who the Lord is, who Jesus is. And uh, that's going to be tomorrow here at the church, 6.30, uh, 6.30 for prayer and 7 o'clock. We're going to be heading out in the streets. And also this Friday is a very special third wave service. Amen. And we're going to be having a guest speaker. It's going to be Keith, the gang leader there from San Jose. Um, so we're super excited. I believe this is the first time that he's probably come out this way. Uh, so different surrounding churches are coming. Different gangs are coming. And it's also something special that we're doing. It's called We Are or We Love the 90s. So go ahead and dress up in any 90s. Um, you know, dress up like a Rugrat or a Hey Arnold or TLC. Come on, somebody. Dress up like somebody. And so that's going to be here at 7.30 on Friday night. And then also on Saturday, um, we are going to be having a gang swim and barbecue. Uh, that's going to be at 4 p.m. at Brother Toby's house. Um, so we want to invite you out, any young person that you have. If you're in the third wave now, you want to claim third wave. Come on now, you want to go to a pool party from 18 to 35. Come on, we want to invite you out to that this Saturday. Oh, come on now. And, and we know everybody wants to be a part of the game. Why? Because lately they've been doing a whole lot. Because not only do we have the, the swim and barbecue, but we also have a road trip coming up for the gang. we got gang on the road coming up. We're going to be meeting here at 4 o'clock, and we're going to just ask for, if anybody, everybody can pitch in $10 for gas. And if you're wondering where we're going to be going, well, we're going to be going to Rancho Cordova. We're going to be hearing our very own uh, gang international overseer speak, Pastor Ryan Kuklinski. Amen. And then also on July 31st at 10 a.m., somebody say next Sunday, it is going to be our United We Can Day. Amen. And so how many know, again, you give to United We Can if you do not. This is your chance to be envisioned and to see what we do as a ministry. Amen. We give to build churches, rehab homes, and training centers. Amen. Me and Jason are both alumni. Amen. So you giving gave to God speaking to us, our time of separation. And so as you see us here today, there can be very a lot more youth that you would see up here by your giving as well, going to the training center. Amen. And so we want to challenge you to dress up in your uh, international gear, whether it's Mexico, Japan, wherever you want to, uh, go ahead and participate in that this Sunday. And there's also going to be a United We Can taco fundraiser. Hey, come on, tacos. It's going to be at $10 a plate directly after service that morning. Amen. Amen. And then also on Sunday, August 7th, at 10 a.m., we're going to be having a Victory Home celebration going on. Now, that's where we're going to be celebrating. That's where we're going to be celebrating all of our, our Victory Home, especially specifically our men's home. Because how many of you guys know that we love our home? Why? Because our roofs have started from the home. Where many people have come and they've been able to get restored by being a part of it and completing these programs. We just want to be able to celebrate these homes. And then not only that, but also on that day, we have the Women's Home Grand Opening. Oh, come on now. Now we're going to be meeting, first of all, here at the church at 5, and we're going to be here for prayer. Then we're going to have a little bit of a service um, over here at, at 6 o'clock. But then afterwards, we're going to be going over towards, uh, over to um, the actual women's home itself, and we're going to be doing a ribbon-cutting ceremony. Now myself, I'm pretty excited about this because I know that my old brother and, and his wife, Elisette, they're going to be overseeing and being directors of the women's home. And it's super exciting it's super exciting to see my own family to be uh, answering the call of God and serving God in, 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 in this specific way because we all know that there's a need. You know, there's a need in this city. But yeah, just come, come check us out on, on, on Sunday. Yes, so also I want you guys to all say what's new. What's new? This is a very new announcement that none of you have it heard yet okay so it's something going to be taking place on sunday august 14 14th at 6 p.m at our sunday night service we are going to be having pastor christian from bo philippines come on now we're super excited amen it's always a privilege and an honor for us to host uh, international speakers international pastors amen and so 
uh, we want to challenge you to invite a friend, invite your family, and God's going to move, amen, God is doing a work there in the Philippines, and we know the revival that's taking place there is only, he's going to bring it here, come on now, God's already doing a work here within our church, so him coming is just going to add on to what God is doing, amen, again, that is going to be Sunday night, not Sunday morning, um, so right now you can go ahead and turn your attention to the screens for a video. Support world missions and do what you love. Hi, my name is Adrian I'm from Victory Outreach with the Mother Church. And all my life, I've loved to just play sports and be, be active. And it's a great way to just burn calories and just have fun with other people. Room for all means to me that I get to make an impact all around the world through the money that I raise. The money that I raise helps save inner city youth. And this year, I am hooping for hope. This year, do what you love. Sign up today by visiting vorunforhope.org. Our string of DNA starts from the streets of LA to the sidewalks of San Jose, now to Stockton, California. We're having rallies all day. But before I speak on Mega, we must understand roots. You can find the stories in our history books. So kick back and relax as I lace up your boots because tonight God is looking for recruits. Roots are the pictures in our hallways. Roots are the names under this stage. Roots are the flyers under that freeway. Roots is our family here today. Mudville is our location. Reaching hurting people of the world is our obligation. Unsaved are lost because of their association. Christians aren't effective because they're held back by their applications. In Stockton, Mega represents three generations. Let me break this down by explaining our foundation. Pastor Sunny was given a mega vision. In the streets of East LA, between God's love and the junkies, there was a collision. Our pioneers had flyers in their pockets. That was their ammunition. Number one mission, go to the kingdom of darkness with a plan of demolition. The vision was their ignition, which caused a mega decision to go to Mexico, Europe, South Africa, Latin America, and to be faithful to the Great Commission. Now Pastor Ed, he had a mega heart. The general, the trailblazer. Northern California was his mega start. I can imagine him pulling out a, pulling up a map, pulling out a dart, connecting with a couple, beginning to impart, letting them know God set you guys apart. Pack your bags and get ready to depart. Go paint the city with this vision and let that be your piece of art. That's how V.O. Stockton started in 1985. From God's heart to Pastor Ed's desk, one of the three musketeers in my eyes, he was the best. Now 37 years later, we can still hear honor, commitment, and loyalty. Pastor Ed's heart and vision will last for all eternity as he rests in God's royalty. Now Pastor Carlos has a mega mission to expand and put all the descendants in position. Building arrows for God's queer, picking a city or a country to deliver, and executing this third wave strong like a river. From San Jose to Modesto to Stockton, all along his life has been aligned. Pioneering DNA has been transmitted in the Velasquez bloodline. Last name outreach, first name victory. What he models and defines is protecting the values of our ministry. How to have integrity, walk with dignity, and honor the Holy Trinity. Three generations, one God, a third wave revival. The, the orders are final, love God, take our city, roll up our sleeves, and stop playing survival. Come on, give Jesus some praise here tonight, amen. Well, welcome to our third wave takeover service tonight. And I love what Jason said because I love that the fact that he said that Pastor Sonny said, he said, I am a third waiver, amen. That means that there's no one that's not included in the third wave. It's the first wave, the second wave, all doing something for the kingdom of God. And that's what we're doing, doing tonight, amen. We are going to be talking about uh, what this ministry is all about. You know, we just came back from conference and we talked about mega. We talked about acceleration. And, you know, and the title tonight of my message is I am Me mega. Someone say I am mega. Now, you might be hearing this message tonight and you might hear the title of my message and you probably already excluded yourself out. Why? Because when it comes to vision, when it comes to the call of God, you don't see yourself becoming mega. You don't see yourself answering the call of God because you have allowed circumstance to get the best of you. You've allowed what's happening right now. Mario, how can I become mega if my life is in shambles? 
Mario, how can I become this great leader that God has called me to be if, I, if I'm struggling in prayer, if I'm struggling with coming to church, if I'm struggling with all that? But listen, put that all to the side. And believe it remove every doubt remove every every lie of the enemy but tonight believe it in your heart that i am mega someone say i am mega we're gonna open our bibles and i pray you join with me in this portion of scripture first chronicles chapter four first chronicle chapter four verse four verse nine through ten two scriptures looking at a man a simple man a man that when you're reading this uh, First Chronicles, you, this man stands out for over 600 people. In this part of the Bible, it's called the genealogy, where you find different names, and it's just going on name after name after name. This is the son of so-and-so. This is the son of so-and-so, and it's just giving you a, an entire lineage. But the writer of First Chronicles decided to pause for a second and tell us about this man right here in First Chronicles chapter 4. Verse 9, it says this, now Jabez, I want to say Jabez, was more honorable than his, than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. There it is. His mother called him Jabez because she bore him in pain. She set up his destiny from the moment he was born. Verse 10, and Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand will be with me and that you will keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. I love this part. So God, so God granted him what he requested. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this service. God, we're grateful, Lord, and thankful, God, for this ministry, for our leaders. God, for, for, for leadership, God, that we're willing to sacrifice, God, that we're willing to see beyond, God, themselves, Lord, so that many of us, God, could come and, and receive your word and be discipled, God, and be used for your honor and your glory. I pray for your anointing upon this service, upon this message. Set me to the side. Holy Spirit, partner with me tonight to deliver this word. I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name, we all say. Now, I'm grateful for leaders who don't settle for average or for the bare minimum. I'm grateful for leaders that understand the great commission to go out into Samaria and Judea and to all the other parts of the world. I'm grateful that there was a, a founder by the name of Pastor Sonny. Now listen, I'm preaching this message and I'm not preaching this message to get claps. Okay, so because a lot of times we could say, oh, Pastor Sonny and this and that, and then, you know, everybody claps, right? Because that's the thing to do. But I'm not preaching this message to get claps. I really want you to understand the history of our ministry, that we would not be here today if our, if our founder did not sacrifice his life, the comforts of life, so that you and I could be here today. And we just came back from a conference, right? And for those that went, and if you were able to watch it online, the focus was on acceleration and becoming mega. I love, and you, even if you, if you were here on Sunday, you, you heard the, the last part of the recap video where Nikki Cruz said, you want, you want a mega church? Start with a mega heart. Right? And we see other churches that are part of the body of Christ and how they have enlarged and they become mega churches and are making a great impact in their part of the world. There are churches all over the United States and all over, you know, in, in, in the entire world that are mega. They're huge. They're, they're packing thousands. They're stadiums that are packed. And they're doing a great work in their part of the world. And our founder and our elders reminding us, reminding you that God has called Victory Outreach International to be mega. And if God has called Victory Outreach International to be mega, then Victory Outreach Stockton is called to be mega as well. Mega churches 
are built by mega leaders. Mega churches are built by mega disciples. Mega churches are built by mega prayer warriors. There's three points tonight, and if you're taking notes, write these, write these, uh, these points down. Looking at the life of Jabez, he teaches us three things about mega. The first point tonight is this, is mega is a culture. Someone say mega is a culture. See, Jabez was a part of a family. He obviously had parents, and the Bible says that he had brothers. And Jabez was given his name because the day of his birth, he was born in pain, which honestly blows my mind since, I mean, from stories, right? Every child's born in pain. It's not like, you know what I mean, right? But for some reason, the Bible tells us that he specifically, out of his brothers, was born in pain. So his mom, which should go into our woman's home, hello, for naming her son Jabez, her mom named him Jabez, gave him a title, gave him an a identity based on her situation. So since a young age, Jabez grew up, and all he knew was that he was a burden to his family. Jabez grew up, and every time he heard his name, he knew that at one point his mom was in pain. Every time that Jabez, uh, they said his name, they, he was reminded of the pain that he caused to others. So his destiny was to cause pain to people, to cause sorrow to people. There should be a lot of people in this place that should have been called Jabez. Because all you did was cause pain. All you did was do people dirty. All you did was backstab people. Why? Because all you wanted was to cause pain and to hurt people. You shouldn't be called what you're called right now. You should be called Jabez because you cause a lot of people pain. But his destiny, because of his name, was to cause pain to those around him. Before Christ, let me remind you that some of us should have been called Jabez as well. You know what that does to a child? When you call them a name like that, when you call them stupid, when you call them loser, when you, when, when you get frustrated with their homework, oh, my gosh, why aren't you getting this? You know what that does to a child? It messes them with, with them mentally. Now, let me tell you something. It does two things to certain people. When I get called loser, it makes me stronger. I, I, don't, I, I don't let no one define who I am. Why? Because I know who I am in Christ. But to certain people, but to certain people, when you call them loser, they actually receive it, and that becomes a part of their identity. So this is a warning to be careful what title you're, you're throwing on people. That it's, it's for us to be careful and to be careful with the words that we use when we call in certain people. It all depends on the individual. Some, it makes them weak, but others, it makes them stronger. So Jabez lived in a culture that his family created a culture that he was supposed to create pain. But I love Jabez because Jabez did not allow himself to live in the culture that his family created for him. Jabez did not live as a victim blaming people for his situation, but rather used every obstacle as a stepping stool. Look at your life and look at the excuses that we might have made. Man, I, I was born in this family. Well, I, I was dealt this hand. I was given the short end of the stick. But Jabez had a different mentality. He said, I don't care how I start, it's how I finish. It's not about who I'm born into, but who, who, who gave me salvation and who, who let me be born again. Listen, you're no longer a part of the family you were born into. You're a part of the family of God. And in the family of God, you're created to do something bigger than yourself. You are a part of the family of God. Jabez used every obstacle that he faced as a stepping stool to his new destiny. 600, over 600 people were named in this genealogy, and only one man stood out. 600 different backgrounds and different upbringings, and I'm sure that some of them had the same story that Jabez did, but Jabez had a different mentality. He, ha he didn't have the world's culture, but he had God's culture. We love the stories of the underdogs. We love the movies of the underdogs where they, were, where they were struggling, where they were battling, where they were, where they were going through hell and high waters. But at the end of the movie, they're winning and you're, you're clapping right there in the, in the movie theaters. We love those movies. But 
look at your life. And when you say, man, I have a different mindset as well. I have a different culture. I don't, I don't live a part of the world's culture, but I live a part of what God has called me to do. But when it comes to our lives, we think we can't accomplish, accomplish much. And we exclude ourselves. That's why I said earlier, you could exclude yourself from mega. You could exclude yourself from leadership. You could exclude yourself from this vision because of your circumstance. You're saying, Mario, well, this is what's happening in my life right now. How can I be mega? You're living a part of your culture instead of what God is trying to do in Victory Outreach Stockton. God is trying to raise up mega leaders and mega disciples. You want to become a mega leader? You want to become a mega disciple? Then create a culture of great prayer in your life. And not great preaching, great prayer. A culture of great faith. A culture of great ambition. A culture of great passion. A culture that says, I don't give up when the going gets tough. But you keep on going. Second point tonight is mega is in comfort. Mega is not comfortable. See, Jabez didn't pray according to his circumstance. Jabez prayed against his circumstance. Look at this in, in, in verse 10. We know that in verse 9, he was named Jabez because he was born in pain. Verse 10, he didn't pray because he didn't pray according to his circumstance. He prayed against his circumstance. He said, he said, and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause any more pain. He didn't pray according to his circumstance, but against his circumstance. And the prayer that he prayed, hear me, church, there are prayers that you will pray that are uncomfortable to pray. And the prayer that he prayed was uncomfortable to pray. God, stretch me. It's not a prayer that's comfortable. God, use me mightily. is not a prayer that's comfortable. God, enlarge my territory. is not a prayer that is comfortable. And listen, if you want to be mega, then you're going to walk a life of discomfort. What, Mario? That, you know, I don't want to hear that. I want to hear about comfort and, and dandelions and love and all this stuff. Listen, if you want to do something great in life, it's not going to be comfortable. If you want to live in God's perfect will, what God has perfectly for your life, then you're going to live a life of discomfort. You know, we got everything mixed up, us American church. We go to the American church talks about comfort. As a matter of fact, the American church embraces comfort. How do I know? Because there's five different services that you could join to if you want to sleep a little on Sunday morning. Oh, don't worry about the 8 a.m. service. You could wake up at uh, you could wake up at 11 and join us. Right? Be comfortable. The American church actually embraces comfort. But if you want to live a life of comfort, my friend, you're not going to be mega. As and 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 and, and take the word mega out, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to do nothing great with your life. Why? Because even the world understands that if I'm going to do something great with my life, it's going to be an uncomfortable road. See, the American church has preached comfort. But let me ask you this. Do you think God really cares about your comfort? Who told you that God wants you to live in comfort? Which one of the YouTube preachers that we listened to, that we listened to told you that God wants you to live in comfort? If you look at the Bible, every man of God, from Elijah to Paul, lived a life of discomfort. The first church, the persecuted church, the church right after Jesus' resurrection and he went up to heaven, will laugh at us today if they saw the way that we serve God. They died. They in their time, they passed laws to kill Christians, and they still found a way to gather. Today, there's freedom to gather, and we find ways to get out of it. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, 13. This is Paul talking about his life of discomfort. He says this, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. 
See, people have forfeited the call of God because they wanted to live a life of comfort. People have forfeited the call of God because they wanted to live on a full stomach. They wanted to live with plenty. They wanted to have the American dream. They wanted to have the nice house and the white picket fence. They forfeited the call of God because they wanted to live comfortable. And I thank God for leaders Hear me, church. I thank God for leaders who didn't want to live in comfort. I thank God for Pastor Carlos and Sister Athena with their children took on the challenge to pastor Victory Outreach Stockton through an uncomfortable transition and have been faithful and committed to the work God has called them to do. I thank God for Pastor Jeremy and Sister Connie for years of living in discomfort, giving of themselves and their family and their resources to build men of God. I thank God for men like Pastor Reuben and, and, and his wife, Sister Nancy, for being strong spiritual pillars in our church and still strong even through this uncomfortable season. I thank God for men and, and women like Jay and Christy with three young children, left the comforts of their house and their job, moved into the men's victory home, and are raising disciples and pastors for tomorrow. I thank God for Elisette and Puma, with a newborn, did not want to live comfortable anymore and have took on the challenge to becoming our next woman's home directors. See, comfort doesn't impact others. Uncomfortable people, people that are living in uncomfort are the ones that are making a difference, are the ones that are impacting lives, are the ones that are changing the world upside down. Those are the ones that are making mega statements. Those are the ones that are making me mega moves. Why? Because they understand that God does not care about their comfort. Look, let's look at this third and last one. Mega takes construction. See, Jabez prayed and he said, and we read it, God enlarge my territory. What he was saying was, God, make me a mega leader. God, make me an asset and not a liability. God, make me a blessing and not a burden. If, if, if I'm not sure if Jabez really realized what he was praying, but what his prayer really meant was, Lord, make me a hard worker and not lazy. If someone wants more land and a bigger territory, then it comes with hard work. The desires that you have to be used by God will not come knocking at your door. The mega that God has for your life requires work, requires rolling up your sleeves and putting your hands to the plow. I love God because he includes us. He includes you and I in what he's doing in the world. He includes you and I in what he's doing in Victory Alley Stockton, in our city, in our community. He includes us. I love that because he could do it on his own. But he wants to use his people. He's looking for vessels, broken vessels, clean vessels that are willing to roll up their sleeves and become mega leaders. There was a time in the children of Israel's life where the temple was broken, right? And in, in, in the part of 2 Kings and Chronicles and all that part where, where Babylon, the Babylonian king, came into their, to their city and pretty much destroyed the temple. They took all the articles, right? If, if you know the Bible, you know that part of the story, right? They destroyed the entire temple. Imagine, imagine a different city, right, coming in and destroying Victor Ari Stockton where everything was torn down. Seventy years they, they, they were in Babylon, right? And God decided, you know what, it's time to build my temple. Haggai chapter 1 verse 3 says this. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much but harvest little. You eat but you are not satisfied. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. Verse 7, this is what the Lord of heaven army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord of hosts. 
What God was saying is this, is that he took them out of exile. He, he broke the chains of bondage out of their life. He took them out of slavery. He took them out of drug addiction. He took them out of gang violence. He took them out of poverty. And he said, it's time to come back into the house of God. But they found the house of God broken. They found the house of God where bricks were laying everywhere. They found the house of God in ruins. So God says, you know what, it's time to build. So you know what they did? They actually obeyed, right? In the, in the Bible, if you look at when, when God speaks to man, there's two things that they do. They either disobey or obey. And most of the time in the Bible, for whatever reason, the human nature, our nature is to disobey God. Right, because it's easier to disobey than it is to, to obey. But in this story, they obeyed God. They said, God, you know what? If you call this out of slavery, then we're going to do a great work for you. Doesn't that sound like victory outreach? God, if you broke the chains of addiction, then I want to serve you for the rest of my life. I want to build in your house. I want to put my hands to the plow. So that's what they started doing. They started building back brick by brick, layer by layer. They started putting windows. They started putting everything back how it was, right? But you know how, what, what happened? As they were building the house of God, you know what, what, what took them out? Ask me. They got distracted. I, I love it because a lot of times we think the enemy takes us out of the will of God. The enemy did not take these people that were called to build back God's house. The enemy didn't even step in. You know what took them out? It was them wanting to build their house rather than the house of God. You and I could get real focused on our house, on how our house looks, on paying, on, on making sure our house is beautiful and beautified. And, and don't get me wrong, that's great, that's amazing, but the house of God needs building. The house of God requires work. The house of God requires teachers. The house of God requires ushers. The house of God requires your labor. While your house is beautiful, don't get me wrong, it's, it's great. But what are you doing in the house of God? Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? See, when I say build mega, I'm not talking about taking this message and applying it to your personal life. I'm not saying that. I'm going to build a mega house. I'm not talking about I'm going to build a mega house or I'm going to build a mega business or I'm going to build a mega social media. I'm not talking about building like that. Oh, Mario, I'm going to take your word and I'm going to apply it to my personal life. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God's, God's house. I'm talking about giving mega. I'm talking about giving your time mega. I'm talking about, I'm talking about giving your resources mega, your talent mega. When building mega, it requires to be God-centered and not self-centered. See, these people were building something great for God, the house of God, where God's presence was going to dwell and every nation could come and experience God's presence. But they were so self-centered that they got distracted from the work of God and they started working on themselves. I, I love what Pastor said, and, and, and I, know, I know this is something that is God because I heard Pastor Carlos said it first and I was watching a message of uh, Pastor Tim Delena actually from New York, New York Times Square Church, and he said the same thing. That this generation, our generation, not just my generation, but every generation is focused on self-care. And, and he even said it that there's apps that take God's position. For example, you have anxiety, just download an app. You're not sleeping good at night, download an app that plays ocean waves. And, and you're, taking God, you're, you're taking an app and you're replacing it. You're, you're replacing what God can do for your life with an app. We're so self-centered. Oh, it's all about me and how I feel and, and what I want to do. You know what I love about this? I, and and, and I'm, I'm in this mode where I'm telling myself that it's not about me anymore. Right? I, and it's not about me. God said, I'm going to build my house. And I would think that God said that I'm building this house for you. He didn't say that. I would think that God said, I want you to build this house so that you could come in and bring your children and you could live in my presence. He didn't say that. You know what he said? I want, I want you to build my house so that I can be glorified. So that I could be honored. When you're building for God, it's not for you. It's not for your recognition. It's not so you could get applause. Ultimately, you're building so that God can be glorified and honored and that the world can see that there's a God living in this church. But when we're self-centered... We want people to recognize us when we're teaching. 
We want people to recognize us when, when we're ushering. We want people to recognize what we're doing. Yes, we're going to recognize you. We're going to applaud you. But ultimately, that's not the point. You're doing it for God. You're doing it so God can be glorified, so God can be honored. And when you think like that, you're thinking mega. See, I love this portion because God tells them that they were working for themselves, but they were seeing few results. Look at, look at what he said in between, this, in, in between the scripture. He said this. He said, you have planted much. You have given much, but harvest little. You eat, but aren't satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. He was telling that to self-centered people that were working on themselves. When you work on yourself, you see few results. When you work on yourself and work for yourself, you're not going to see God results. But when you work for God and you put your hands to the plow for what God has for your life, you're going to see God results. You're going to see mega results. You're going to see God actually doing work through your life. These people were building for themselves. As they were building this temple, the people began to complain. The enemy to construction is complaining. I used to work in construction, and there was this one guy, and, there's a, and I, I see his face right now. Whenever our foreman would tell us, man, okay, this is the, this is the job for the day. We're going we're gonna to try to put as many panels as we can. He will always complain, oh, why would we have to put all this? And, and, and honestly, it's an ugly attitude to have when you're trying to construct something. When you're trying to do a work for God, complaining kills construction. We are good at complaining. We are good at pointing out what's wrong. We are good at saying what's, what's needed and what's not needed. We are good at doing all that stuff. But are you good at putting your hands to the plow? Are you good at building something from scratch? Are you good at not complaining and constructing? See, quit complaining about your church and start building your church. Quit complaining about leadership and get your hands to the plow to help the leadership. I love this quote that said, look for a leader and if you can't find one, be one. Look for a leader that you can connect yourself to. And, if, and listen, there's leaders here that you can connect yourself to and get a lot of wisdom. But for whatever reason, you can't find one in this church, then be one. Quit complaining about why isn't there a, their teachers and become a teacher. Quit complaining about they're not singing my favorite worship songs on a Sunday morning and join the worship team. Quit complaining about the New Year's Eve party not being the, the best and join the, the Matrix team. Get your hands to the plow and build the house of God, ultimately so that he could get the honor and he could get the glory. I love God because for every complaint that we have, he has a solution for it. The people in this portion of scripture began to complain saying, God, the job is too big. A complaint. God told them, the job is mine, so let's work together. The people began to complain, the resources are too small. God told them, I am your source, and I own all the resources. The people began to complain, what we build will not be as great as the past. God told them, what you build, I will fill with my glory, and that's good enough. When you and I build this church, in Haggai chapter 2, he says that the, 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 the latter shall be greater than the former. Some of us are trying to live in the former days when God has something greater in the latter. You, some of us are trying to live in, man, well, back then, this is what we used to do. But God is doing something new right now. God is doing something new that where the latter is going to be greater than the former. 37 years of ministry, Victory Army Stock, than we have been since 1985. And the latter shall be greater than the former. You and I. And we receive this word, we're going to be a part of the latter being greater than the former as the worship team makes their way tonight. Let's all stand in this place tonight. God has mega for Victory Ari Stockton. God has mega for you and I tonight. And maybe the, the word mega turns you off. That's fine. But God has something big for your life. God has something great for your life. God didn't just call you to be free from drug addiction. God called you to live a life of purpose, 
a life that constantly gives? Where will we be if there, if there weren't men and women of God that gave their life so that you and I could be here? Where would we be at if people back then didn't live mega? Where would we be at right now if they didn't leave the comforts of their house? If Pastor Ed didn't leave SoCal to come to NorCal not knowing what was going to happen to build a church, to send out churches? Where would we be at? I love history because history reminds me that people sacrifice so that I could be up here. Do you know the history of our ministry? Do you know the history of the Christian church? You know, I, I, I told the gang this one, one time, right? I preached Romans 1.16, right? For I am unashamed of the gospel. That scripture, we use it today as a, don't be ashamed of the gospel because your reputation is going to be distorted, right? Your reputation is going to go downhill, right? Because a lot of times young people are ashamed of the gospel because people will look at them a certain way. We are afraid to share the gospel because we fear our reputation being being um, ruined back then what it meant was their life being taken away that's what it meant back then it didn't mean that the reputation was going to be ruined it meant that their life was going to get taken away that they were going to get hung on a cross that they were going to get uh, burned alive that's what it meant that they were going to get stoned alive so when Paul says do not be ashamed of the gospel it's not because of reputation it's never been about that that's why I love history because it reminds me that there were people back then that I could connect to right now that gave their lives so that you and I could be here. And if you think like that, you're going to be a part of what God is doing in our church. You're going to want to live with your hands to the plow. You're not going to allow your circumstance to dictate what you do for God. You're not going to allow what the society has called you, what your parents called you, what you called yourself, or what the enemy has called you to, to dictate what God has called you to become. You're not going to allow the comforts of life to take you away, to, to, to cause you to forfeit the call of God. But you're going to be someone mega. Lift up your hands here tonight. Every eye closed. Maybe you're still doubting me tonight. Maybe throughout this entire message, you ignored this entire message. And that's fine. But I want to let you know tonight before this altar call opens that God wants to use your life. God wants to use you in Victory Ari Stockton. God wants to use some couples in Victory Ari Stockton. Not only that, but there's still couples that are going to get ready to get launched out. Why? Because we're a part of a ministry that believes in mega. These altars are open tonight. If you want to come and declare over your life, God, I am maker. God, I am maker.
what I love about this message is that he talks about being in the culture, Megan's not comfortable, and that Megan takes construction. You know, those three things are not easy things to live. But the culture embodies our life. Everything. It's the way we talk. It's the way we live operate, it's the way that we move, it's, it's absolutely everything that we do. It's a culture. To not be comfortable is difficult. Because life today has taught us to be comfortable. From pillows, to couches, to cars, to your phones. It's not easy to live uncomfortable. Construction is difficult to build your life, to build your children, to build your ministry, to build your disciplines. Some days, have you ever felt when you see your yard and you look at it, oh, I'll just do it tomorrow. It's too hot. You got a project that you haven't done in five years and every day you push it off because construction is not easy. It takes a lot, whether it's money and time and, and effort and, 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 and selflessness and all these different things. It takes a lot to do construction. What well, about this message today is that these young, these third waivers, not, third waivers is a generational thing and we understand that. But we're talking about the gang for today and the young adults. If I'm being honest with you, a lot of them live this. A lot of our, you know, you can say what you want to say about our, our gang leaders, but they do live this. They're not perfect, but they live this. They're trying to build a gang ministry. They're trying to build young people. They're not perfect at it. They may not do it right every time, but they continue to try to build in days in and days out. They're not comfortable. I got two guys that left their jobs, good jobs to take not such good paying jobs. They come to the offices, young, different young adults and different young people, they come to the office and, they, and they, they're here. They're the last ones to leave. I got young leaders that have children that continue to come and they come with their children. It's no longer why I have kids. I can't do it. No, they bring their three kids. They bring their one kid. They bring their two kids and they continue to come. They're not comfortable. Many of you that lead life group, this group of young adults and young people are not comfortable. You want to know what a lot of our young people do, our teenagers do? It's summer. They could be at the pool. They could be at home sleeping in. They could be at home. You know where they're at? They're here. They're here. They're here watching their siblings. They're here. You think that TV was only put up by adults? No, that was by young people. You know who runs all these screens? It's young people. You know who put their itinerary together? These young people. They come and sit at the desk. They come and learn how to do flyers. They come and learn how to do ministry. They come and learn how to do their gang nights. They take pictures. They build, and they're not comfortable. It's a culture. All these you know what, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm seeing, I told them, be careful. I told the adults, be careful. These young people are not adults. They look like adults. They all look like adults. They act like adults, but they're not adults. In their culture, they want to build. They want to serve God. They want to do what God's called them to do. They're not comfortable. They're, 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 they have a culture. And I think that we need, number one, we're going to call the, to the gang team, the leaders of the gang team, and then we're going to call up these young people. But let me tell you before I call them up, it's not easy. Church. Adults. It's not easy for them. You want to know why? Because they're young. They want things. They want to have, they want, they, they're concerned for their future. They're tempted. 
Just like you're tempted, but their tempting comes at a fast pace. The internet, their school, their jobs, because they're single. They, they feel loneliness. They feel discomfort. They want finances so they can buy things, so they're not going to depend on nobody. Listen, they go through a lot of stuff whether you think so or not. Don't you remember what it was like when you were a teenager? When you were a young adult? And we say, ah, oh, this generation, they got eye syndrome, I, I, I. Some of you adults got I, I, I. Sound like, 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 Speedy Gonzalez, I, 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 I. Look around you. Drummer, keyboard player, worship team, photographer, cameraman, sound man, media person, usher, greeter. They're all over this place. Teacher, helper evangelizing. You say, well, pastor, is it a young church? No. No, it's not. It's just that they're learning to do what you've been doing and what you still do. Listen, they're not trying to take over the porch. They're just trying to sit on the porch with the big dogs. They're trying to, they're trying to learn from you. They're trying to do what you do and what they've been seeing. But we got to pray for them. Look at them and ask them and imagine what they probably went through today, but they're here. They're all going through something. They're all facing something. But you know what they want? They want to serve God. They want to love God. They want to live pleasing to God. They want to do something great for God. Who taught them that? Who showed them that? They saw it from you, and they saw it from others, and they want what God has done in your life, but they want to do it bigger. They want to do it better, not to show off, but to be, make you proud. So you can say, listen, what a good job you've done. Today, I mean, what does I promise? Today, I was watching something, and I wrote a sticky note, and I put it on my bookshelf. I said, you know what? One day I want Pastor Sonny and my elders to say this about me. And he said, the quote said this, you are what I vision it could be. When you look at these young people, we want to be able to say, Mary, you're what, the, what we vision it could be. Chanel was what we vision it could be. Jaden what we vision what it could be. Jason what we vision it could be. Angelina what we vision it could be. Listen, we had vision that God was going to change lives and raise up men and women that were going to take the world. And this is what the vision is. You're what the vision is. Lyle is what the vision is. Jay is what the vision is. EG is what the vision is. Right? Nick is what the vision is. She didn't get excited. That's what I mean. This is what the vision is. Drug addicts, gang members, people that should have died, but they're saved. They're set free. They're doing the work of God. But young people that have never done drugs, never robbed nobody, never went to prison, that never experienced the pain of the world, are able to serve God and do exactly what you did. That is the vision of the third way. These are our descendants. These are the ones that, that the Lord will never leave them. I don't really say much to him when I watch him come. But Vincent is what the vision is supposed to be. I know that. Oh, you, you guys are this? Oh, man, there's a beast of a world shaker in there. You guys have no idea what's inside of that young man. He knows it. He's like the incredible hawk. He don't want to let it out because he knows what's going to happen. all of them. How do you envision all these people? I envision world shakers. Stop saying, oh, this generation. Say, yeah, this generation. Stop looking at them like they're difficult. They are difficult, but you were even more difficult. Oh, they're strong-minded, this generation. But man, when you inject the spirit of God in them, 
And when they have the word of God in them and the anointing of God in them, there will be nothing on this planet that will ever stop them from serving God. The future, I believe, is secure. It's secure. Even hearing this message today makes me even more certain that the vision and the future is secure. Do you believe that the future is secure? Give the Lord a hand of praise. Do you believe that? Come on, man. But the future includes all of us. Because I'm, I'm 43. Don't try to retire me. I mean, you guys can stand next to me, but you ain't kicking me off the porch. I'm still right here. I can still bark. I can still bite too. I can still scrap for the Lord. But these little ones right here can scrap too. Jody, you can still scrap, right, Jody? Rob, you can still scrap, right, Rob? Woo, Rob's a bulldog, boy. Kanye, can you still scrap? Can we still scrap for the Lord? I said, wait, none of us. There's a big porch. There's a big porch for all of us to do what God's called to, to be a mega mega church. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand of praise here this morning. Amen. This morning, this evening, I want to call up Mario. I want to call up Danielle, Nayali, um, Mike, and Clarissa here this evening. Amen. I want them to make their way up here. Amen. Can I just meet with you? Marissa, Mike, Mario, Danielle, and Nayeli, amen. Let's give them a hand this morning, evening. Huh? Oh. While they're calling her to come up, I want some of the leaders to come up here and pray for them here. We're going to pray for them tonight. And why I'm having you come and pray for them is because they need you, amen. Um, can we stand behind all of them? Can I come in? Do I have enough people? Amen. Let me get some more people. Come on. Kanye, Lyle, Bean, Jody. Let's get some more people up here to pray for them, amen. I want to pray for this team and every other young adult that I have. You know, I got young adults that do work. I want, we got to pray for Momo and Christina. They're still young. Solomon, right? Madi, Toj, every young adult. Leanna, Jason, Jaden, young adult now. But this group leads this gang ministry, these third waivers. We got to pray a hedge of protection upon them, an anointing upon them, that God would give them the creativity, the strength, the finances, and everything that they do in order to continue to build this gang ministry. We got good gang leaders. They ain't perfect, but they're good. And me and my wife, we're grateful for them. And every other young adult that's in here, we're grateful for them and what they do. So I want you to extend your hands here this evening to them. And we're going to pray for them here tonight. Father God, right now, Lord, I come before you, Lord God, and I pray, Lord God, for this third wave team, this gang team, Lord God, that leads this generation, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would lay hands, Lord God, that you would anoint them, Lord God. And Father God, as they continue to build, Lord God, that Father God, the things that they face, Lord God, the trials, Lord God, the temptations, Lord God, that you would guard them, Lord God, that you'd watch over them, Lord God, that you would protect, Lord God, that anointing upon their life, Lord God, that they would never become dependent on themselves, Lord God, or their talent or their giftings, Lord God, but that Father God, that you would use it, Lord God. Father God, to raise up young people, Lord God, to disciple them, Lord God, to love them, Lord God, to build them, Lord God, give them the ideas, Lord God, the creativity, Lord God, but they would stay, Lord God, within the convictions, Lord God, and the values, Lord God, and they would live and preach the word of God, Lord God, and Father God, they would worship you, Lord God, and that they would pray to you, Lord God, and that Father God, that their foundation would remain strong, Lord God, as they impart, Lord God, into these young people, Lord God, into the church, Lord God, into the ministry, Father God. 
And I know, Lord God, that there's greater things for their life, Lord God. But I pray, Lord God, a double portion of your anointing upon their life, Lord God. Touch them right now, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody says... Now, we're going to do it one more time. Um, go ahead and step here, guys. All the young people that went back there, come up front. Stand in front of your gang leaders. Um, and I want every young adult, if you're under the age of 35, I want you to make your way up here. Amen? Everybody, I don't care. If you're behind a, a, a ministry or whatever, like a soundboard or whatever, it doesn't matter. Just come up here anyway. It'll be all right. If you're under the age of 35, make your way. So I'm not in the game. I'm 35. I'm 34. I'm 35. It don't matter. Look at this group of, of people that are under the age of 35. church these people right here and there's more up here right now than there is out there almost in a sense okay it's simple if you're 35 or younger just come up amen now listen those of you that are watching online as well amen those of you that are watching online as well those of you that are watching online as well Listen, we need every single person. If you're over the age of 35, we need you. We need you to pray for these young people. We need you to pray that God would cover them and watch over them. But listen, we're a three-generational church. It don't, it don't matter your age. You can be 101. If your arms still move and if your mouth still moves, it don't matter what part still moves, we can use any part of your body to do the work of the Lord. <laughs> Some people say, well, I don't know, Pastor. Is there room for me? Oh, there's room for you. Because I got young couples getting married. I got young people that need to, to know what it is to, to serve in the house of God. They need to know how to work. They need to know how to budget. They need to know how to pray. They need to know how to fast. They need someone that can listen to them and talk to them and share with them. Listen, every person has a place in this church. Just because God raises them up it doesn't mean that someone's moved out of the way. No, we're just making room for more people. So if those of you, I want you, those of you that are out still in the audience, I want you to extend your hands with me tonight. And those of you that are online, I want you to extend your hands tonight, amen. I want to pray for this group of young people here this evening, amen, that God would use them, protect them, guard them, amen, and lead them in this time of their life. That they say, I want to live a life that's made, that's committed to God in everything that I do. Pray with me here this evening. Father God, right now, look, I thank you, Lord God, for the first generation, Lord God, and the second generation, Lord God. That, Father God, they helped, they built this house, Lord God. They created a foundation, Lord God, a church that prays, a church that fasts, a church that believes and reads the word of God, a church that evangelizes, a church that seeks, a church that that speaks in tongues, a church that is Holy Ghost filled, is led by the Spirit, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that that same, Lord God, foundation, that same Spirit, Lord God, that would fall on this group of third waivers, Lord God, of young people, Lord God, that want, that want to serve you, Lord God, that want to live their life, live their life for you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that they would be dependent upon you, not their gift, not their talent, Lord God, but that you would use them, Lord God. Use them, Lord God, to take this city, Lord God. Use them to take this world, Lord God. But I pray you would guard their hearts, that you would guard their mind, that Father God, that they would value the call of God, that they would value the giftings of God, that there would be a group of young people, Lord God, that seek you, Lord God, that pray, that fast, that worship, Lord God. I pray right now, Father, that you would lead them, Lord God. I pray you would strengthen them, Father God. And I pray, Lord God, right now, Lord God, that we as a church, Lord God, would invest in them and equip them, encourage them, love them, Lord God. And Father God, enable and empower them, Lord God, to do all that you call them to do, Lord God. And we thank you for this generation, Lord God, and how you use their life. And we give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise here this evening. 
going to get ready to close in a word of prayer tonight, amen. Don't forget that we have evangelism tomorrow, gang service. You guys can stay up here. Gang service. Um, just go ahead and stay. Gang service on Friday night, amen. And don't forget this Sunday, you know, we can day. So why don't you bow your heads with me. We're going to close in a word of prayer here tonight. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing, Lord God. We thank you for this word, Lord God. We thank you for this service, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you continue to move in this generation, Lord God. Continue to use them and anoint them to do all that you call them to do, Lord God. And be with those that weren't able to make you, Lord God. Those, whether it was health or other reasons, Lord God. But I pray that you would guide them, direct them, strengthen, Lord God, and make their way back, Lord God, for this Sunday, Lord God, as we come back, Lord God, to worship you, Lord God, and minister, Lord God, and see you do a great move, Lord God. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, amen. God bless you, and we'll see you this week.